if you remember when we considered together Genesis chapter 23, we spent quite a bit of time talking about how sort of odd it is that uh, God would uh, commit uh, so much space, a whole chapter, uh, to the account of Abraham buying a uh, burial plot for his wife. When we turn to chapter 24, which is what we're going to be considering uh, today, we have a whole chapter devoted to uh, something that seems a little bit more significant. We have this chapter uh, committed to the the, the bringing together uh, of Isaac and his dear wife, Rebecca, and the process by which this comes to pass. And it too is a whole chapter, but I should make note of this reality that uh, chapter 23, dealing with Abraham buying the burial plot for Sarah, is 20 verses. Chapter 24, dealing with uh, Isaac and Rebekah, is 67 verses or 66 verses. Not exactly the same uh, size, but we do have in this chapter, uh, as in the previous one, a sort of self-contained story. Uh, We have a beginning, a middle, and an end, uh, all built around God's plan to get Isaac a wife. Now, and by the way, Abraham's plan as well. If you remember from last time, we talked about how it is that uh, God is at work in all of these events, that there is this question, uh, how is this story going to move forward? How are people going to make it? How How is the, the promise going to be fulfilled? And now uh, Isaac is uh, older. He's of marrying age and Abraham realizing that Uh, none of these promises are going to come through if Isaac doesn't marry, uh, but also recognizing, rightly so, that Isaac should not uh, marry from those who are in the uh, area where he's living, uh, sends a trusted servant back to the old country uh, to secure a wife. Now, one of the most foundational principles of a sound understanding of how to interpret the Word of God is this principle, that we are to interpret the historical in light of the didactic rather than the other way around. We interpret the historical in light of the didactic. Now, that sounds a little bit more complicated than it actually is. All that simply means is is that it recognizes that there are parts of the Bible that are telling us what happened, and there are parts of the Bible that are teaching us uh, what is true or teaching us what is right and proper, uh, and it's very easy to to confuse those two, and that can lead you into some very unhealthy places. Uh, my favorite way of describing it is this, that if you want to know uh, what the Bible has to say, what it teaches us, what we're supposed to believe about marriage, uh, the right way to, to, to find that conclusion uh, is to look and see what God had to say about marriage in the Garden of Eden, what God had to say about marriage in uh, Ephesians, to look and see what Jesus had to say uh, when he was dealing with uh, the Sadducees and they were asking about Uh, remarriage and and that kind of thing. And Jesus said, from the beginning, it was not so. One man, one woman. That is Jesus teaching us the right view of what marriage is supposed to be. You don't say to yourself, well, uh, I have my Bible. The Bible's true in everything that it teaches. The Bible teaches that Solomon was the wisest man of all men apart from Jesus And therefore, I'm going to look at Solomon as my uh, model for what marriage is supposed to be. Uh, Solomon, you may remember, had 700 wives, and I'm not sure how many concubines, or maybe it was 300 wives and 700 concubines. It was some absurd uh, number, though, of course, two is an absurd number as well. Uh, Don't look at Abraham and him and Hagar and him and Sarah. That's not the picture. Well... 
It's not just a question of what the Bible says about marriage. What does the Bible say about how a husband and a wife come together? I spent many, many years uh, deeply involved in uh, the homeschool movement here in the United States and uh, still committed to homeschooling. And part of that sort of subculture uh, was its commitment to the idea of courtship uh, and its rejection of the, the, the common American dating kind of system. And I maintain that conviction as well, just like I do uh, with respect to homeschooling. But uh, it is a far easier thing, and what I did in my book, When You Rise Up, it's a far easier thing to actually find the notion of homeschooling in the Bible than it is to find uh, the notion of courtship in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell us this is the way you're supposed to do this. This is the way husbands and wives, before they are husbands and wives, become husbands and wives. There is no uh, list of biblical dating rules, uh, much less a list of, uh, or a, a an affirmation of dating as a sound principle, but the same is true with respect to courtship. We don't have that information. And if we look at this story and we make that mistake of confusing or, or uh, reading what happened as what is supposed to happen, uh, we're going to end up in some, some strange places. Uh, this is, uh, in many ways, a very romantic story. This is a story of uh, God's grace and God's active involvement. You remember, as we mentioned already, Abraham sends his servant back to the old country uh, with this charge to bring back a wife for Isaac. And uh, the servant is uh, eager and zealous to serve Abraham and Isaac well. Uh, but he himself is unsure. Well, how do I know who the right one is? He does know. He's uh, Along the journey, he's brought with him uh, all sorts of gifts, heavy laden camels filled with gifts. He knows that's part of the plan, but he doesn't know how he's supposed to discern who the right one is. And so what this servant does is he lays down a kind of fleece. Now, uh, it's not my task in this uh, series to cover the book of Judges, though I confess I was close to choosing Judges instead of uh, Genesis. But in the book of Judges, uh, we have the story of Gideon and his fleece. That's where this language of laying down a fleece comes from. If you remember, uh, Gideon was fearful. Uh, God was telling him to go and, and go into this battle and do this and do that. And, and Gideon was unsure and he, and he, he made a prayer and he said, Lord, um, I want to be sure I'm understanding you. I want to be sure I'm hearing you. I would be uh, strengthened and encouraged if you would be willing uh, to sort of send me a message to let me know. I'm going to lay out this fleece, and if you would make it uh, wet, but the rest of the drown ground around it dry, uh, then I'll know that I'm hearing from you and hearing you accurately. And he wakes up the next morning, and the fleece is wet, and the ground is dry, and so now Gideon's ready to go. Well, now Gideon's not ready to go. Gideon's still fearful, and he says, look, I, you know, almost like when Abraham was negotiating with God over Sodom and Gomorrah, Gideon's like, please, can we do this one more time, but let's do it the other way around. If you could make the ground wet, but the fleece dry, then I'll know for sure uh, that I'm hearing your voice. And that's what he does. So this is the kind of thing, even though it happens before Gideon, uh, this is the kind of thing that this servant is doing when he, he prays and he says, Lord, you know, when I come uh, to the place I'm supposed to be, it's my prayer, my hope that you will uh, show me who the right one is uh, by having uh, her respond the right way with respect to uh, the giving of water. So, uh, that's precisely what happens. He well, let me see if I can find his uh, prayer. He, he did have ten of his master's camels filled with these gifts. Uh, 
He said, O oh Lord God, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please, let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels, let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Now, that prayer, that story, uh, one of the reasons the chapter is so long is because it gets repeated multiple times. That is, he prays that prayer, then that's exactly what happens with respect to Rebecca. And then when they return to uh, the family, he's asked her to explain himself, essentially. And he recounts the story again, including the prayer and the event. So God hears him and answers him. You know, uh, there's a call that we have here, I think, to uh, a, a kind of balance. Uh, we, we don't want, to, and, and certainly the people of God did not in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, or the New Testament, we don't want to treat God like a uh, uh, magic eight ball where every time we've got a question uh, we shake the magic eight ball and we ask it and we ask God to give us an answer but you don't want to fall off the other side of the horse either and deny the reality that God is active uh, and that God can and will uh, reveal things to us uh, I'm actually in the place that I am in large part because of a fleece uh, if I can tell that story very briefly, just to illustrate how important it can be and how it's changed my life, uh, I was in a situation where uh, my dear and precious wife, Lisa, before she was my wife, before we had uh, any romantic connection whatsoever, uh, we had had a... Uh, relationships, maybe not the right word, but uh, I was giving her some counseling and trying to help her with some issues she was dealing with. And then because of some issues I was dealing with, I had to end uh, all of our conversation back and forth, which was all online. And after I did, uh, Lisa reached out to me after seven months of silence from me and you know, just asked me how I was doing. And I didn't respond because I said I wasn't going to be responding. I wasn't mad at her, um, but I just didn't think it was a good thing for me to be responding. So I didn't respond. Well, about a week later, she had a dream. And in that dream, uh, I was coming to pick her up. I arrived in a limousine. I uh, had these witnesses there to... Uh, you know, sort of behold our coming together. I would, I, we were at a table together and I put my hand over her hand in a symbol of protection. And Lisa, God bless her, uh, woke up frustrated and angry at God for giving her this dream about me thinking that God was teasing her. But she did lay down a fleece. She said, I'll reach out to him one more time. And if I don't hear from him, I'll know this was not from you. But if I do, I'll know it was from you. Now, remember, she had reached out to me just a week before. Remember that I had not had any uh, communication to her over the course of the previous seven months. She sent me a message, RC, have I done something to offend you? An hour later, I responded. Friends, God is active and God is at work. God is near. And God delights to speak to us. Now, I'm not saying, again, that we can always know. I'm not saying that if you can't decide whether to get the pancakes or the French toast, uh, that you should lay out a fleece and try and determine that. But, uh, you know, who you marry is a pretty significant question. And... I am so grateful that God brought me and Lisa together. And as we continue to go through this chapter, chapter 24 of Genesis, we find that Isaac and Rebecca are both grateful 
for God's work. Now, I do want you to notice something here about this story. You know, there's a lot of, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, a lot of uh, sometimes strident uh, demands that we all recognize uh, how Jesus honored uh, women and their importance in the story of our redemption, uh, all of which I agree with and believe in. It's a great thing that uh, Jesus gives honor to Mary, that Mary responds so well to the announcement. It's a wonderful thing that Jesus appears first uh, to women and women first receive the announcement of his resurrection. That's all good and true, but I want you to actually push it a little further. You know, we spend a lot of time, or we should anyway, uh, praising the faithfulness of Abraham, who was willing to listen to God. When God said, get up and go to the land that I'm going to show you, Abraham did not lay out a fleece. Abraham didn't do anything but say, yes, sir. He didn't even ask, well, where are we going? He just said, okay, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. And that's a good thing. That's a praiseworthy thing. That's one of the ways that we see that he is the father of the faithful. But we see the same thing with Rebecca here. She doesn't know Isaac. She's never seen Isaac. She's never met Isaac. She doesn't know Abraham. Never met Abraham. And she is invited to go and to leave and depart from her family. And she does. And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, May you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate them. And off she goes. Now, despite the length of the chapter, we're not told uh, a blow-by-blow -blow account of the lengthy journey back to where Isaac is. Instead, after that blessing that's pronounced, verse 61, we read, Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy and was dwelling in the Negeb. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then what happens? Then they go off to the soda shop to... See if they're compatible. Take in a movie at the drive-in. No. They come together as husband and wife. Verse 67, Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah his mother and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Now what's fascinating to me is that the very last words of the chapter Hearken back to chapter 23, for we read, So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This marriage, through whom is going to, or through which is going to come, the fulfillment of all of God's promises, is also a comfort to Isaac in the loss of his mother. Rebecca is a blessing. She is a gift from God. And that, friends, is where I want to close today. The scripture tells us that a father can give houses and wealth. But a virtuous wife 
is a gift from the Lord. Isaac was grateful. Rebecca was a gift. And whether you know it or not, your spouse is a gift. If you are a wife, you are a gift to your husband. God is good. He puts the lonely in families. And he gives good gifts.